I did about 10 million in revenue, um, for sure. About three, three and a half million every year for the last three years. Have you ever wanted to be a business owner? And that's what I like about football and business. You can build yourself into anything. Just because you start off as a small 100 pound kid, you leave 235 pounds big because you put the work in. And transportation is very difficult with all the overhead and all the costs that you'll incur getting started. This has been one of the best opportunities for me. I don't even know if I would've ever got into entrepreneurship if it wasn't for this program. And today we're gonna to talk about that. We're gonna talk about becoming an Amazon DSP. Think of it as you're a franchise owning a fleet of trucks for Amazon operating under their umbrella. We're here with Sidney Tarver of People First Logistics and he's gonna talk about his incredible journey in becoming a DSP from working with Amazon to actually becoming a business owner. I was trying to go the corporate route. I wanted to keep elevating in corporate America, but that wasn't my calling. I wanted to get to that $100,000 a year job. I don't know why that was the dream, but I only got to 72,000. So I took that leap of faith and started my own business where I could um, get myself a raise. This is Sydney Tarver, the owner of People First Logistics. You're now watching Truck and Hustle. All right, so now you're a business owner, man. You get started with Amazon DSP. Tell me a little, about, a little bit about what Amazon DSP is and about um, just their business model. Amazon DSP, that's the Amazon delivery service provider program. Um, they get you started, like we said, the franchise model. So think of it as you're a franchise owning a fleet of trucks for Amazon operating under their umbrella. Um, so basically you're getting paid by the hour to do the service for Amazon and per package piece, they give you a few incentives. So you're just working directly with Amazon and they're paying you to provide a service for them. My specific um, DSP uses cargo vans, but they have every level. They have cargo vans, they have box trucks, and they have an 18-wheeler component to the DSP program. So if you apply, there's it's different websites, but logistics.amazon.com is for the sprinters and the box trucks, and then they have the Amazon Freight Partner Program, which is what they do with the branded 18-wheelers um, for the Amazon. The 18-wheelers? Yeah. Okay, got it. So when you first get started, how many trucks do they start you off with? Is this something that's kind of your choice or do they just like give you a certain amount of trucks to get started? No. Tell me about that, or vans yeah. rather. The vans, well, they want to get you to 20. So the baseline is 20, but you're going to start with five and they might deliver you five every week for five weeks. So you start with five routes for two weeks and then you build up to 10 routes for two weeks, then 15 routes for two weeks, then you get to 20. And then based on your performance, they can go up from 20. So if you're doing good, like we say, you get that volume share, you can go up to 25, 30, 35, 40. You keep progressing. If that scorecard is right, if you're hitting fantastic on all your metrics and KPIs, fantastic, fantastic plus, they're going to give you more volume. So the better you perform, the more volume you do, you get. The worse you perform, they can take away the routes. It's in the contract. All right, let, let's dive into the, the scorecard a little bit when you have the, the poor to fantastic, fantastic plus. Um, so that you said, do you typically run Fantastic Plus? Where does where does people first usually? Usually, I get Fantastic. It just depends on the season. Like, okay, I'm gonna give you an example. If it if I'm running 20, 25, 30 routes, I can hit Fantastic to Fantastic Plus all the time. It's when you ramp to that forty and fifty route when you just hiring anybody off the street. They come because you want to get your volume of routes up. You might it stretch you to scale to train the drivers. You might get a little rough running like peak season. I might run like great, fantastic, because we just added 20 more people, 20, 40 more people in a two-week span mm -hmm. where, yeah, we need, we need the people, but we got to still lock in with the quality. You got to keep working them in like that because they don't – you might not have got the same training that everybody else got. So usually around peak season is when I kind of fall off and just – I just play the numbers game because I'm trying to run the most routes as possible. And that's as probably everybody, yeah. right? Because if you're yeah. adding more people, you don't have the time to train them. They're yeah. newer drivers. So they're kind of just going out there and they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. So, of course, more mistakes are going to yeah. happen. So I'm sure that's not with you. That's probably every, everybody. Not for sure. Right? So. Got it. Now, what about equipment like maintenance and all that? Is that something that you have to take care of or is that something that Amazon does for you? Um, like driver damage. If my driver wrecks a, a vehicle, I have to pay it. Um, we bill it with insurance, but routine maintenance, oil changes, tire balancing, the, the routine maintenance, Amazon, we have an element um, fleet card and we partner with Pep Boys and we can get all the routine maintenance done for free. Amazon pays for that. Okay. Is there any specific type of insurance you have to have required? You have to have million dollar cargo insurance. Um, so you have to have a million dollar policy, auto, GL, 
I think it's like three different ones with whatever the, yeah, you have to have like a million dollar cargo policy though, for sure. Okay, and when you got started, did they help you with those resources or did you, did you have to find that out on your own? No, Amazon, I'm telling you, they give you the list for vendors for body shops in your area. They give you insurance people to reach out to. If you want to get your employees health insurance, they give it workers comp insurance. They give you all the vendors for everything that you're going to need. It's basically a business in a box. You just have to come in there and bring your leadership skills and bring your energy and, and lead the team. Got you. But you're negotiating like price and stuff like that with these different vendors. Yeah. For or you, you can use Amazon's vendor because it's more of a set rate. But yeah. then if you know some, your brother got an insurance trucking company, you can go with them if, yeah. if it covers all the qualifications. What did you have to do to transition from an employee to a business owner with Amazon? You just they put you in a I say about a two or three week onboarding program once you go so they're helping you get your llc they're helping you get your business bank account they're helping you get your dot number your fcm they're putting you on a uh, if you they're giving you all the steps to do this and they're they got a coach that's leading your way through it holding your hand they don't just hang you out to dry that's why i tell people to partner with billion dollar companies because they already have the infrastructure and the know-how and you're not just guessing at it it's already a franchise format like McDonald's cookie cutter A B C D process and then you'll have your own company. Yeah. So it's literally like like a franchise. Yeah. Basically. So they connect you with all the resources, everything from the legal aspect of forming the company to equipment, resources, maintenance, everything. They're just like handing it to you. Right. Got it. Okay, so you said that's like two weeks, a two week program? Yeah, they give you a two week uh onboarding program and from the time I quit in March to I quit Amazon in March 2020, and I launched my company in July 28th, 2020. So three months from quitting, I was able to launch with Amazon. To so launch. People First Logistics is born. Yeah. So when you out the gate, what do you start out with? Five routes. Just five routes, about 10 drivers. I mean, everybody starts with five. Even if you had 20 drivers, they it's just, just start with five and five. see if you can do this. Okay, so five routes and 10 drivers. Yeah. So you had to hire those drivers prior to starting, obviously. Yes. So that was all a part of the onboarding process in that three weeks. You had to run ads to get drivers. Definitely. How did that work? Running ads. I had to move, quit, move to Buffalo from Atlanta, um, get a condo apartment out there, and start having hiring events, talking on the phone, Zoom calls was out there. But we were meeting at the Amazon place. They had the building. It wasn't it wasn't launched yet, but we could have interviews and sit in there. So I just got to work interviewing, hiring, staffing up. So was the the main way you hired through those Amazon hiring events or did you use anything any no. other means? Indeed. Okay. We had an Indeed account, Zip Recruiter, Indeed, Facebook. We were just reaching out anything we could to get people to sign up and uh, get on this opportunity. What kind of guidance do you have in terms of what you're offering the drivers? How did you know what to offer them? How did you know how to pay them? How did you know, like, you know, and what were you offering the drivers? What was, like, their compensation packages look like? Oh, it was Amazon started. Amazon already has a minimum wage that you pay, so Amazon has that 401k. You have to give them 401k insurance, health, all this stuff. It's okay. already a, that's all set up. Already. Yeah, it's already you put that straight into your ad from Amazon. The, the same copy. Okay. The same um, pay. It, it started at 15. Now it's 1975 is the minimum that I can pay my drivers because Amazon says that it, I couldn't pay them 15 if I wanted to, and it's my own company. Amazon sets the limit for you can pay them more though. Yeah, definitely can pay them more. Okay, so there's a floor. Yeah, which is it started at that time. It was fifteen dollars per hour. Now it's like nineteen seventy five or whatever the case may be. Right. All right. So you have that guidance. So you know how much you can pay. Uh, and you said in terms of all of the uh, other compensation packages, like the uh, workers, I'm not, not workers, workers comp. They have yeah. workers comp, um, health. Ins health insurance, four hundred one k, four hundred one k. All that is through Amazon. Yeah. And they're all set up with that already. They, you get them in like 90 days, you can get them to see if they stay because it's a lot of turnover. But yeah, 90 days, you can usually offer them all that type of stuff. Okay. Sure. Who, who's like taking care of like payroll, compliance, those type of things? The people on my team in house. Um, I have my own in house team that, that works and knows how to do payroll and all that type of stuff. Where do you find those people in the beginning? When I worked in Atlanta at Amazon, I hired. I took two people with me that were working with DSPs in Atlanta, and they came to work for me up there. So I had two people that was already okay. veterans in the game. So they, they moved out there with you? Yeah. What, what, what would make, how would they have the faith to move out there with you on a new upstart? Because like it's that? me, and I gave them $5,000 <laughs> to move out there with me. <laughs>
I like the cause I, it's me part. Yeah, no, nah, I gave him I gave him a bonus incentive to move five thousand. Okay. Uh, we figured it out. So they so they moved out there to you with you to Buffalo. You yeah. gave them five thousand dollars to relocate and they were like your first that so those were your first hires. Yeah, like pretty much operations manager and like a compliance paperwork payroll type person. Okay. Making sure that your compliance is on point is an integral part of any trucking related business. Today, I stopped by my friends over at Fleet Drive 360 to talk about what they're building to make sure that you can run a successful trucking company. And it's everything from the minute you decide you want to hire somebody through maintaining all of your FMCSA compliance documents for ongoing fleet or, or owner operator truck uh, business. You've got a driver hiring and recruiting module where you'll create driver qualification files, import digital documents. You've got a drug and alcohol module where you can schedule pre-employment drug tests and manage an ongoing testing pool. We've got an accident registry so you can keep your mandated accident logs and even schedule follow-up uh, drug testing for post-crash. We've got vehicle maintenance logs so you can not only maintain the compliance status of your vehicles but also upload your work work orders and compliance related documents so you're audit ready when they come in. We've got a document repository, fancy words for digital cloud storage of any document that you want, not just necessarily the compliance documents, anything related to your business, post crash videos, performance evaluations. And then finally, you've got the dashboard and the dashboard's the most important part. You can close your eyes and glance at our dashboard, open them, glance at the dashboard and immediately know whether or not you're compliant or not, both on a driver, company and vehicle level. It's one stop shop for all your compliance needs. Has there ever been a moment where you had to jump into the van and, and do a delivery yourself? Oh, yeah, I remember the <laughs> first six months starting up, man, because I don't want to drop a route. Like if, if it comes down to it, one of my guys call off. If it got to get done, I'll, I'll get in the truck and do it. How often does that still happen? No, nah, that don't happen no more. But <laughs> it was maybe once or twice a month I'd end up driving around um, in the beginning, six months. But that wasn't no problem. I mean, I didn't have nothing else to do. But I, I expected that. I was working seven days a week. Why not? Right. I just wanted to get off to a good start. Yeah. Got you. And for the drivers, when they get on these routes, are they like giving like directions, like turn by turn? Yes. How does that work? Yeah, um, we got phone devices, so pretty much your cell phone, but it's an Amazon app. I have like 70 lines with Verizon, and it's an Amazon app, uh, the Amazon Flex app. So every morning they log in, their username, password, and their route's already assigned. The zip code is basically like following the GPS on your phone, but it'd have package one, two, three, two, like 200. It'll tell you all your stops, how many packages goes to this stop where to leave it at at the customer. So Amazon has their own software that we put on our devices. And um, yeah, it's pretty much turnkey software. Like just think of Waze or Google Maps, but it's telling you where to drop the package at the house and the address, all that information. Yeah, where, where do where do drivers typically make the most mistakes in, um, is it delivery process, is it the loading process? Like, like when mistakes happen, where do they commonly happen? Most people, newer people, I would say, how you start your day is, everything if you if you get in there and don't organize your truck right from the beginning you're going to have a horrible day because the packages come in sequences and orders so if you out of order you're going to be operating in chaos all day so pretty much the morning the loadout is the first most important part of the day where you load that vehicle amazon gives you 20 minutes to load the vehicle um, you need to put it in order they give you a sheet to show you the order that it goes into and that's the most important part of the day. Got it. So the driver loads the truck and then delivers it. Yes. Got it. So they have a, okay, got you. So they load it from the, I guess, the last stop in the nose and then they go right. backwards yeah. to the first stop. Yep. Okay. Got you. Um, typically, how uh, long does it get for it before a driver like really understands what they're doing and they're kind of trained up and you could be confident with them on the route? And do they have like trainers or do they go out yeah. by themselves or do you send them out with somebody? Well, they, Amazon provides a training class for three I think it's a three-day training course. Before you can even touch a van, get on the road, you have to go through Amazon's training and pass it. And then once they do that, I put them with my driver trainer. So they get two or three days out on the road just working one-on-one -on -one with one of my best drivers. So they probably get six, seven days a week of not even with Amazon training and two or three days with me before they can even get behind the wheel. They're working with my best drivers, my driver trainer, showing them the ropes of the job. And then the next week, we probably give them their own route. 
Got it. In terms of like maintenance for equipment and stuff like that, like are you do you have like PM schedules? Like how often? Yeah. How does that work? Like when you have to bring the vehicles in for maintenance yeah. and so forth? Yeah, um, we got it. Amazon has a fleet team. I have a fleet manager. Um, shout out to Jacob. But um, it's so much tech and software with Amazon. It's tracking. You're gonna get an alert. Truck number 26 needs an oil change coming up in 500 miles. It's think of logistics, the old school logistics, but with Amazon being a tech company, they've integrated so much stuff that it's you you have to be blind or not paying attention. <laughs> it's so many alerts and emails that your truck needs an oil change, needs yeah. tires balanced, like the technology. Think of social media notifications, how we get those. They're yeah. doing that for the truck company with you. After getting an overview of how the Amazon DSP business works, we wanted to get an idea of what made Sidney Tarver the successful entrepreneur he is today. We decided to head over to a place reminiscent of where he started, a field of dreams, if you will. What's up, man? What's up, buddy? How you, how you doing? doing, man? Good, Good to, to see you, man. Sure. Uh, I figured I'd bring you somewhere where, you know, you'd be comfortable, man. Uh, this is bringing back memories. <laughs> I'm ready to do some drills right now. It got me ready out here. It's bringing back the smell of the fresh grass. It's all bringing back memories. For, for sure. sure, man. How, how important is football in your life, man? It was one of the, I mean, it was my identity for the first, I'd say, 22 years of my life. Football was my life. Eat, sleep, and breathe football with a little bit of academics, you know, in there. But this is my identity for the first 22 years of my life, being yeah. raised by a football coach and, and stuff like that, for sure. For sure. Tell me how, uh, how, how football translates into into business football translates into business because i mean a lot of the key components that you got to be disciplined you got to wake up you got to be the first one in the office the last one out the office if you really want to learn what you're doing you have to be able to lead a team um it's not an individual sport yeah you can be the best person but if your team you're only as strong as the weakest link on your team so you need to get everybody on your team up to speed and up to the standard that you need to um those are pretty much the discipline and the leadership is what it is for me and the teamwork, team building. Yeah. I like working with team people. I know it's a lot of people who can do that, be good by themselves, be the shining star, but I'd rather see the whole team win. For sure. Know? Was that something that you had to de develop or do you feel like you just always innately had those skills and those abilities or did f football help you develop that? It helped me develop it because even in high school, I, I wasn't the best player on my – I was never always the best player on my team. I was just – I'm the guy who going to go to workouts. I'm going to do my work. I'm, not, I'm doing all the small stuff right by as one superstar athlete, but I'm doing the small stuff that eventually turning me – making me fast, making me strong. I'm just as that because I do it every day. Yeah. Um, and that's what I like about football and business. You can build yourself into anything. Just because you start off as a small 100-pound kid, you leave 235 pounds big because you put the work in. You can see the, the actual results. And just like business, if you do something every day, consistently get better, learn, and fix it, you'll grow into a big business, from For small sure. business to a big business. For sure. Tell me about um, after high school, you know, get going to college. What college did you go to again? You went to Tennessee State, Tennessee in State, Nashville, Nashville H HBCU. HBCU. Tell me about that transition, man. After high school, going into H going to HBCU. Yeah. Did you intentionally go to HBCU, or is that just kind of where you ended up? Just tell just, me about that. Well, yeah, going from a all white private high school to a HBCU was definitely a total change of worlds. Like going from all white people to an all black college, it's just like <laughs> it jumbled it up. But yeah. um. I went on a visit with my friend. I went to 10 college visits, but I went to this last one with my friend, Rico, from where I'm from. He played for my dad, actually, in high school. Okay. So I knew the guys, and we went on our visit, and we had so much fun on the visit. It just felt like we were going to play with our family. Um, that's how I made the decision going there. And um, they had good academics program. Oprah, Oprah is one of the graduates. Our famous alumni probably is Oprah from Oprah. Oprah. Yeah. Okay, that's so, where Oprah went. Yeah, she went to our college. Man, so you don't get no more famous. Nah, than so that, we bro. had that. <laughs> we got good academics and education. So it was the best of both worlds, man. Party and bands, cookout, fraternities, all that stuff. Like just like the movies, man. It was just like that. Yeah. How, how did you balance uh, athletics, being an athlete, and then being an academic in in college? Yeah, the student athlete. They put the student Student athlete, they put emphasis on student. I mean, after practice, we'd have to go to study hall for an hour to do our homework. So every day we were after practice, 
So you tired, you still got to put an hour in of doing your homework. So it was structured. You had people helping you pick your classes and make sure you're on the right track, tutors and all that stuff to keep you focused. It was pretty much a full time job playing, being a student athlete. You got to wake up at six in the morning, go lift weights, go eat breakfast, go to your classes, go to practice, watch film, go to study. So eight, 10 hours out of the day, I was I had places to be at all times, kind of like a full time job. Yeah. Were you were you looking to get uh, drafted into the NFL? Was that a dream of yours? It never was a dream. I knew I was good enough to play at the next level. But like you said, my parents just Sydney, just if you do anything, just make sure you graduate and get that degree. Yeah. Anything else was extra. So I went to college to get the degree. And the NFL just happened to be the extra gift that came, you know, from putting in the work. Got you. But so you didn't get drafted, but you did decide to go into the NFL. Yeah. What made you decide to, as opposed to, you know, uh, following your degree, you know, you do have a degree in logistics. Yeah. Um, what made you go into the NFL first just to kind of get that burn, that yeah. desire out? Yeah. Or what was that about? No, you definitely got to. I mean, that's still a dream. You definitely everybody if from the day you start playing football, you dream to go to the NFL because that's what you're aspiring to be. You're watching it. You're doing it for that. So to receive a paycheck off of the skills, the football that I've been playing for 12 to 15 years for free to get paid to make like be a professional at something, it's a big accomplishment and I don't take it lightly. Um, so very exciting, um, great opportunity. And um, but I want people to know like the business of it, like football's cool. But life after football, you know the statistics. A lot of athletes go broke after they're done playing. They can't do anything. Their body banged up, concussions. Their mind's bad. So if, I just want the athletes to know it's, it's other paths. Everybody's not going to go pro, and you need to have an, another plan when your dream comes to an end. Yeah, and what made you major in logistics? I mean, that's not a very popular major at all. Um, How did you get into that? Yeah, I... I originally went to, I wanted to be a pharmacist. I don't know why I wanted to be a pharmacist, probably because I thought they made a lot of money at the time when I was a kid. I used to hear doctors, lawyers, you know, you hear the certain fields, but it's all the money. Right. But I took a chemistry class and I was like, yeah, this not going to work with football practice. Like it, it just, I didn't have enough time to put into the, the pharmacy field. And I talked to one of my friends, big brothers. I was like, what, what's your major? I'm thinking about changing. He was like, look at supply chain logistics. And I just took that leap of faith from there. Blind, didn't know what it was. I just figured if I get into business, cause you hear business, like I'll be able to do something with business. Like I can't go wrong. Yeah. 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 And when you got into it, was it challenging and in, in learning about supply chain logistics? just because it's brand new to you yeah. was it a challenging thing for you it wasn't challenge i know just about class like everything you just got to show up i knew if i showed up every day and applied myself i could at least make a c to pass and get a degree <laughs> i'm a fan of c's get degrees just the bare minimum to pass to the next level you know what i'm saying so i was there showing up every day i might not have been the smartest student but i did enough to get by had a good relationship with my teachers and professors and and made a way Got it. And you play football for a year after you graduate, yeah. right? You, you're a walk-on with the Cleveland Browns? Yeah, the Cleveland Browns, and then I got picked up on the practice squad by the Jacksonville Jaguars got um, you. for that year. And how much were you making on the practice squad? About 6500 a week. Okay. And yeah. you do that for about a year, you said? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you're in the NFL for, you know, uh, a year. Yeah. You realize that dream. Yeah. What happens next? You know, I came back home after I got cut. It was a little bit like right before Christmas. Me and my buddy, we worked out at this gym, and he had played 10 years in the NFL, Tony Brown. And we looked at each other, and we was just like, we both had that look like it's over. It's time to the next phase of life. He went on to be a football coach. Um, at a local college we have, and I took the opportunity to go to Chesapeake, Virginia to start working for Damco, a guy named Terry Philpott. Gave me my first real job, real shot, making 50K um, as being like a supervisor in a warehouse company. How, how, did it, how did it feel for you emotionally? Like to, cause like when you're at the, in the NFL, you're like in the top, at the top of the world, right? Yeah. And then you have to go get a regular job. Yeah. Did, did that impact you at all emotionally? Did it did not feel like that for you? It didn't really feel like that for me because I was just grateful for that, the opportunity that I got to go. Like I, I knew in my mind that I had accomplished something that nobody, most people that I knew were never going to make it to that level. So I had already had that level of understanding. I was grateful for that opportunity, but I'm a, I move forward very fast. I move on very fast. So 
I just checked that off the box and went into corporate America with the attitude, not going in. I went to the NFL. I didn't come in there with that attitude. I came, hey, I'm at the bottom again. I want to learn. It's yeah. just starting from the bottom and learning your skills back up. Did you ever use it, like like telling people you were in the NFL to ever like help you? at all yeah. in your in your in corporate america i i'd say i say it at the right times like you know you you got to bring it out at the right times but yeah. i just don't lead with it like usually people will somebody else will say it or somebody will do it but i'm not just out here braggadocious and boasting about it um i use it at the right time right though. right somebody who's interested like, yeah, yeah, I, used, yeah i used to play for the browns nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah browns fan i used to play for them <laughs> yeah you got to use it at the right times but for sure i want to be rather known as a businessman you know because that I've seen people that are no muscles, no nothing, making billions of dollars, and <laughs> I'd rather be like that and not have to get hit and do concussions and all that kind of stuff. So, right, right, right. Business is my favorite sport now, you know. There you go. So you get you get started. I like that. Business is my favorite sport. I like that. So, so, so you get uh, you get started at Damco. Uh, how much are you making? How much do they pay you? Fifty thousand. And they gave me a five thousand dollar bonus to move up there, so I like that. Okay. I like bonuses. I like signing bonuses. That's the NFL <laughs> part of it. I like that kind of stuff. You like those bonuses? Yeah. And what's and what are you doing at Damco? Just managing operations, forklift, unloading, labor, just accounts, shipping, truck shipping, supply chain, customer service. My the guy Terry Philpot, he was just giving me a. We are here live at OTR Solutions HQ. I'm here with my partner, Jonathan. Man, listen, Factor is an integral part of the transportation industry. Why is Factor important? Absolutely, Ramel. In this economy, in this market, cash flow is king. Cash flow is the key to growth. If you have a young trucking company or if you've been in the industry for years and you want to take that business to the next level, we're absolutely a company that can help. So I hope you'll give us a call today. Let us know what we can do to help you out. Get the rest and roll with the best. Let's go. a crash course in the full perspective of when a container comes from China, we unload it from the port, we put it on a truck, we drive it to a warehouse, we unload it, we put it into another trailer and ship it. So he was giving me the full, from the customer service to the billing, he was giving me the full perspective of like the supply chain, mm. like a year intro into it, just three months in this department, three months in that department and the full spectrum. Got it. So he's like a mentor to you. Yeah, yeah. One of my guys okay. to this day. <laughs> Did you feel like you were using your degree to its fullest potential? See, I, I was, I'm more of the networking, like the, the degree is cool, but I feel like if you have the right relationships, you can get into any room or that way. So I had learned at an early age that the network networking to bring you more opportunities than me just filling out a thousand job applications let me see who is in my immediate network that has a job or is in a position of power that can bring me onto their team if we had the right conversation got it so nah, i'm more of that. that like i do it more like that i love that and you stay with damco for how long about three years three years and then after that what happens i had to get a better opportunity with amazon amazon came calling um did the interview they did another signing bonus. They gave me like 25000 <laughs> to sign with bonus. them. Um, and 75 shares of Amazon stock when it was at $500 a oh, share. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So that was the sign-on package to go to Amazon. I had How to stay that stock for four years. Now, you know? You still got it? Um, yeah. It was at 3500 but then it split back down to one hundred. So it's probably like $100,000 worth of stuff. Yeah. Nice. For sure. Nice. Yeah, that was a good present from them. I that's, appreciate that's that. That's a beautiful present. That's, that's not bad at all. <laughs> nah, for sure. All right. So you work for Amazon doing similar to what you were doing at Damco? Yeah. Just warehousing functions, managing people. Um, if you've never worked in a warehouse, it's a lot of team building and moving boxes, unloading trucks, loading them back on the other trucks. So basic warehouse functions. Um, but they had just now started getting into the DSP business of delivering their own packages. They they got into this business because FedEx and UPS had failed them during the peak season. So Amazon's like, how can we deliver our own packages without any headaches? So they started building up their own in-house team to deliver all their own packages. Um, and I was a part of that for the last five years until I started my own company. Got it. How, how was that uh, when they started doing that? Was it crazy? Was it like hectic? I'm yeah. trying to figure that process out. Yeah, it was a startup, man. It, people look at Amazon and think it's this big corporate organized that, no, it was literally, hey man, put that box on. Like we over there yelling like, <laughs> you wouldn't think it's a billion dollar company if you go inside an Amazon warehouse sometimes, you know? Right. Um, it was a startup. So if you've ever been a part of a startup, you know it's just, you just sprinting really for a long time until you, 
get it off the ground, and then you can start to build around it. But it was it was tough at first. I ain't gonna lie. The startup, whether it's a, with a corporate company or you're starting up on your own, is one of the hardest phases of business to get through. For sure. Yeah. Would you say you enjoyed your job? Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it you- because. Coming from the other company, we was working five, six, seven days. Amazon only works four days a week at manager positions. High-level operations managers only doing four days. So when you get four days, you can kind of do that and then chill for three more days. It was kind of different going into there. So, yeah, I loved it. It taught me everything. Got it. And you worked with them for how long before you get five years, five years. Yeah. And then you get the opportunity to be a DSP. Yes, sir. How how does that opportunity come to you? The opportunity came. Um, just working with the DSP owners, they kept, hey, Sydney, like, why aren't you doing this? They they knew I knew my job well. and I was trying to go the corporate route. I wanted to keep elevating in corporate America, but that wasn't my calling. I wanted to get to that $100,000 a year job. That was like, I don't know why that was the dream. Like, <laughs> once I get to $100,000, i am going to feel like I made it. But I only got to 72000 and then the way up was looking way harder than I anticipated. So I took that leap of faith and started my own business where I could um, get myself a raise. So that's how I thought about it. All right. So as a business owner, uh, what are the things that you have to look at in order to be profitable? How does how does one Amazon DSP to the next, how do they compare? Like, how, how are you more profitable than the other DSP? Or are you guys all kind of like apples and apples where you're like kind of the same profitability? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, pretty much you managing the labor is going to be your biggest cost. So do you have too many drivers? Do you have too many people just in the build, in the operation? You need to run a lean operation. Um, how do you do that? I know what it, I've just been in the business. So I know that like say if you have 25 routes okay you're gonna need 25 drivers you might need two dispatchers in there somebody to hand out the keys in the morning somebody to put the keys up at night um and maybe one extra rescue guy to kind of filter out and help people on the road type guy but that could be a dispatcher so i just know how to run lean um but it's the route. The route counts is what's going to let you know. Some DSPs are running 20 routes. Some are running 30. Some are running 40. It just depends on where you fall it at the route count. But you're going to be able to be profit. Amazon sets you up to be profitable, be profitable. in this business. If, if you're not profitable, it's probably because of something you're doing on your own. Got it. And with your route specifically, so you're in the Niagara Falls area, or do you run at all outside of that area? You're just kind of like in the... I live in I live in Niagara Falls, but our our truck is in Hamburg by the Buffalo Bills Stadium. So okay. we're I'm, I used to be in the Tonawanda area, but I took a move. Amazon asked me to move, so I just moved stations down. They opened a new one up in Hamburg, so we've been doing that for the last about six months. Okay, and how are you? Talk to me about how you like awarded new routes and how you scale, right? Because you said you started with uh, five in yeah. 2018. Yeah. Or was it 18 or 20? 20. 20. 2020, mm-hmm. and then you started to grow. And where you, where are you at now? You have right now we at we like 25 after peak season. We was running like 40 a day during peak, but it just the volume trailed out with Amazon. It usually happens after peak season. So everybody, it, every all DSPs are like, my volume went back down after yeah. peak season. Yeah. Got it. So about 20, 20 25, yeah. right? So you so you, you stay around there. How, how, how does that work? How do you scale with Amazon? And how do you know when you're ready to add more routes, add more equipment? Just tell me about that. Yeah, they have this. Every week you get a scorch card metric of how your team performs. So it'll be a rating, poor, great. Fantastic, fantastic plus. And that's what it's called? Poor, yeah. great, fantastic, fantastic plus. Yeah, they're going to rate you one of those metrics every week. Okay. Um, So if you hit fantastic or fantastic plus, they're going to pay you a bonus. If you just get great, you just get great. And poor, you just get poor. Like, you don't get anything. But you get a rate in every quarter. Like, they see how many – how you how did you do that quarter? How many fantastic plus? And then they go to this thing called volume share. So they'll be like, okay – you have 11% of the station's volume steer. We're going to move you up because you've been performing good in the top one. They're going to move you up by how well your scorecard is. All right, cool. Um, so you said safety, compliance, um, and then quality. Yeah. And those are, the, are those the three main things? Yeah, those are the three. I might be missing something on the scorecard, but those are. I know safety is the biggest. If you mess up safety, you, you're going to automatically be great. If you don't get safety right, which is good, that's how it should be, because you don't want any fatalities, nothing out there on that road, man. It's 
it's serious out there. You know what I'm saying? So, For sure. Yeah. So if you get that fantastic plus, that means you pretty much ran a flawless week. Um, yeah. Everything was good. Uh, and uh, you said you at that point you get a bonus. Yeah. How much is that bonus? Is that something for the drivers or something for you as a business? Well, it come to the business, but you give it. I give it out to the drivers. Does everybody do that? Is that something that you've just chosen to do? I give it to my people. Whatever I can do for my people, I can give people it first. to them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, some people probably don't, but I usually always have been giving gift cards, so we'll put a, the top five drivers a $100 bonus in their next paycheck or get them some food, whatever we do. Yeah. yeah. Is it something that the drivers are aware of that bonus? Is that something that's yeah. more so like, okay, so nah, they, they, know, know. they know you guys get it. Yeah, they know if we hit Fantastic Plus this week, somebody's going to get something. Right. Yeah. So they're so they're incentivized to do a great job because they know that there's a reward at the end. Absolutely. Okay, okay. All right, that's cool. Oh, another thing I wanted to cover. You said team share. Can you explain that again for me real quick? The vo- volume share. So volume each station share. has, I don't know, say 50,000 packages. The performing DSPs are going to get, if you're doing good, you're going to get 10 20%. It just... Your share goes up or down depending on how much your how good you perform. So you're getting more work, yeah. in essence. No, for sure. Okay, got it. And then how do they how do they um, how does it work when you're when you're awarded more routes? Like, is that are those routes being taken away from somebody else and given to you? Most likely, or the volume just went up and the, everybody get a bigger share. But usually, yeah, somebody's gonna go up or down depending on. And that's based on their performance. So if somebody's not doing good in a certain area, they're saying, "Hey, Sydney, I need you to take this on because they're not, they can't handle it." Right. How do DSPs get along with each other? It's fine. I mean, you really see with the thing with the DSP is you. I only see my drivers maybe in an hour because they dispatch in the morning, and then they on the road for ten hours. So I'm only. You really only up there for like an hour, or thirty minutes a day, maybe, and you're not seeing it. You're focused on getting your team loaded right. out, so it's not a lot of talking to this Johnny over here from this DA. It's not like that. Not in my. I keep. I do my business and get out of there. But I, I got some guys when we meet up and have the um, Amazon meetings and we talk about the business. But it's pretty. Everybody to themselves. Really? You know what I'm saying? But so, I got so DSP you, friends and owners that do that, this. That's what I was going to say. So there's like no like where you guys like talk about best practices and different things or ways you can run the business better? They got a Ignite. Amazon got its own Ignite community app where DSPs are on there. But um, I talk to my people amongst each other, but it's pretty like private. Like everybody keep their business to themselves from what I've experienced. Business owners are used to wearing many hats, but accountant should not be one of them. Receipts, payroll, taxes, 1099s, insurance, bookkeeping, it's time to get your back office off your back. You can consolidate your financial operations into one flat monthly plan that takes care of all of your accounting, payroll, and tax needs. Meet Transpo CFO. Powered by Venning, a full-service CPA and business advisor, helping companies like yours save time, money, and headaches. Hate math? We love it and have been doing this since 1978. We manage your entire financial operating system and provide you with a single point of contact, saving you time and money so you can get out of the back office and back to business. What would you say was the most um, difficult part about getting started for you personally? Once you started to get the business up and running, what was the most challenging aspect? It's just that that the hiring, the people, the you. Everybody knows how to operate the business. It's the people that are going to be unpredictable in the business. I got to going, and then two years, one of those first two employees I told you, I had to fire the two people that, I, that helped me start my company. I had to fire one of those, per, like a key part of my company. And that um, that was like starting over, but you want to get rid of the, the the part people that you don't need on your team fast. Yeah. So people hiring is still a challenge every day. We're still I'm constantly evaluating. Hey, does this person align with our business model? Are they meeting the requirements? Because everybody wants to get better. We want to get better each and every year. We don't just get complacent and stick with the status quo. I want everybody to keep elevating their game every year, or we'll swap you out for a new person. You know what I mean? <laughs> Why did you have to fire them? What happened? Just got too comfortable, too many excuses, and and didn't want to grow with the company in the way we were growing. So, 
I had to, it hurt. Yeah, I had to get in there and get my hands dirty again and do some stuff that I might not have wanted to do. But ultimately, it, it helped push our company to the next level because you want to have all the whole team operating on the same, you know what I'm saying, level, everybody comfortable, and you got to get rid of the rotten apples ASAP. Oh, another thing I wanted to cover. You said team share. Can you explain that again for me real quick? The vo- volume share. So volume each station share. has, I don't know, say 50,000 packages. The performing DSPs are going to get, if you're doing good, you're going to get 10, 20%. It just, your share goes up or down depending on how much, you're, how good you perform. So you're getting more work yeah. in essence. Yeah, for sure. Okay, got it. And then how do they, how do they, um, how does it work when you're, when you're awarded more routes? Like is that, are those routes being taken away from somebody else and given to you? Most likely, or the volume just went up and the, everybody get a bigger share. But usually, yeah, somebody is going to go up or down depending on And that's based on their performance. So if somebody's not doing good in a certain area, they're saying, hey, Sydney, I need you to take this on because they're not, they can't handle it. Right. How do DSPs get along with each other? It's fine. I mean, you really see what the thing with the DSP is you, I only see my drivers maybe in an hour because they dispatch in the morning and then they on the road for 10 hours. So I'm only you really only up there for like an hour or 30 minutes a day, maybe. And you're not seeing it. You're focused on getting your team loaded right. out. So it's not a lot of talking to this Johnny over here from this DA. It's not like that. Not in my, I keep, I do my business and get out of there. But I, I got some guys when we meet up and have the um, Amazon meetings and we talk about the business, but it's pretty, everybody to they self. Really? You know what I'm saying? But so, I got so DSP you, friends and owners that do that, this. That's what I was going to say. So there's like no like where you guys like talk about best practices and different things or ways you can run the business better? They got a Ignite. Amazon got its own Ignite community app where DSPs are on there. But um, I talk to my people amongst each other, but it's pretty like private. Like everybody keep their business to they self from what I've experienced. All right. In terms of uh, Amazon paying you? Are you paid weekly? How, how, how does that? How does it pay work? And are you paid hourly per package? Explain how everything breaks down. Net seven. So every seven days, usually every Saturday, I get paid by Amazon from the previous week. Um, and yeah, they pay us for the hour by the hour. They give us a certain hourly rate um, between thirty and forty dollars an hour for ten hour routes. So they pay us by the hour, and then. It's like a per package bonus, maybe a few, I think five cents a package they pay you that you get delivered that week. So that, and then if you hit your incentives, though, the Fantastic and Fantastic Plus, that five cent doubles and then triples Mm. if you hit that bonus. Okay. So it's an hourly for hour, billable hours. Um, So you can pay your drivers 10-hour routes. They pay you a set amount per hour. And then – a per piece count, and then it bonuses and doubles and triples if you hit your right bonus. So financially, in the last, in the three years you've been in business, about how much has People First, in terms of revenue, what have you guys done? We did about $10 million in revenue, um, for sure. About three, three and a half million every year. Yeah. Okay. For sure. That's amazing, man. Do you ever feel like an Amazon employee still, or having this business, do you feel like completely liberated, like it's your own thing? How, how does how is that relationship? Because you're still, yeah. you know, you're still working for Amazon yeah. in, in a way, right? No, nah, yeah, I I definitely feel, and I have all my eggs are in one basket. If we're saying that from a business perspective, but I don't feel like they don't, they can't tell me to do this, this, and this. I still have that control. I need to hit the metrics and hit their numbers and comply to their standards, but they're not in my business. Like, Sydney, you need to do this, this, and this. Right. But I do, I've been working on diversifying and just trying to figure out what else is next for me. Um, outside of Amazon, with Amazon, can we take this relationship to another level? So I've just been exploring those things. And- that's that's a great segue. Like, how, how do you think about leveraging the foundation that Amazon has given you into like like you said putting your eggs in other baskets and diversifying a bit like how do you go about that or how would you go about that or what are you thinking about how are you thinking about going about that yeah i've been working um wrote the book i've made my own online community i started making merch hats um i've been doing speaking events speaking to kids about entrepreneurship so just trying to step into my own personal brand um, nonprofit. I got a nonprofit uh, foundation that actually Amazon gave me five thousand dollars for last year. I won a pitch competition mm. for my nonprofit, so okay. I want to revisit that with Amazon and see if I can do some, 
maybe teach trucking in communities under the Amazon umbrella, just with nonprofit people um, doing that type of stuff. So just seeing how I can build my brand, monetize more. We've been shooting content, um, just really figuring it out day by <laughs> taking it a day at a time and, and just slowly building, meeting new people, networking with great people like yourself to Appreciate that. build my knowledge and take my game to the next level. What about from a, because that, that's more of like a, from a personal brand yeah. standpoint, what about from an operational standpoint, like building a transportation company? Would yeah. you, would you, is there a way for you to leverage the opportunity Amazon gave you to like do transportation for other people? Like that's kind of more what yeah. I'm thinking about. No, I've been, I've got on LinkedIn, a lot of people write me and send me contracts about moving furniture contracts and I just have to set my company up or partner with the right people to do that because I don't want to go back to startup mode again and do that. <laughs> I would rather already partner with existing people and see what we can put our minds together to build an operation mm. instead of me doing the heavy lifting again all by myself. Um, but I'm definitely open to, open to other contracts outside of Amazon. But are you able to do that? Like you can take those same, because the employees are your employees. They yeah. work for people first. For sure. Right? So you can take them and put them on other routes yes. and do other things. It's Absolutely. not like they're tied to just yeah. solely Amazon routes. Nah, yeah. As long as I cover an Amazon, making them happy. If I got extra 20 extra drivers and I get a contract at Lowe's, Walmart or somewhere else, Target, I could definitely run an operation with them. Yeah. Tell me, what do you what do you do for your own personal development and, and self-development as a leader? Are you, are you a reader? Do you like podcasts? What, what are some of the things that you do to build yourself up? Man, it started with reading. Reading, I probably started back reading in 2017. I probably didn't read a book since I graduated college in 2011. <laughs> so I took a lot took of time, time off, off <laughs> just work, live life. But then it hit me. I'm not leveling up. I'm like, what am I doing? So I started back reading heavy. 2017 and that's been one of the biggest things podcasts have definitely helped me great people like you it's a lot of great platforms out there doing their thing in the podcast game um also i'd say probably personal development conferences and all that i probably mm -hmm. invested over 250,000 in my education on going to conferences wow. working with mentors learning internet skills ads building websites just i've probably invested over quarter million dollars in my own education, self-education. What was a book that you would recommend for any business leader to, to read? The book that did it for me was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Mm. Um, just learning how to talk to people. A lot of people don't know how to talk to people or how to have body language or have a conversation um, with somebody that's a stranger, somebody that you don't know. How do you meet more people than you knew all your life? If that makes sense. How do you get outside your original network? How do you connect with that business owner over there across the street? Um, so you need you need to have people on your team, people who like you, people who want to see you do well in the world. Because, um, you know, a lot of times that immediate circle and family and friends, you love them to death. But to get to where you're going, you're going to have to step outside of that circle and meet some new people who might not look like you. They might not talk like you. You know what I'm saying? So That's how to right. win friends and influence people was one that really changed my life. I love that. And, and how important is networking as it relates to business? <sighs> Networking is cliche, like they say, that's your net worth. Because think of all the all the people you hang around right now. Are they do they have are they getting to you to where you want to be in life right now? And if the answer is no, that means you need to get a new network of friends. It's that simple. Yeah. Um, the people, my family, my dad, football coach, my mom, teacher, they education. They didn't know business. But they're good people, but they're not my business mentors. I didn't learn business from them. You know what I'm saying? They taught me how to handle my business and do that. But real business P&Ls, I have to go find people who know how to do that. Professionals in industry, I have to go find the pros like football. I wouldn't go to a plumber to learn how to play football. I have to go learn from the, the best. So, right. You know what I mean? So, right. Got you. If you had to leave the audience with a final thought, just something that um, entrepreneurial or something spiritual or something that you just want to leave them with. What, what would that be? Yeah, just just keep going, you know. Bad times never last, you know. Every storm runs out of rain. The sun always come back up. So just keep fighting. I know it ain't easy. It ain't never. It ain't easy for nobody. Um, so just keep fighting. Keep putting one foot in front of the other, taking steps forward, and um, keep building. You'll be something one day. You just got to keep building and going through life. Don't quit. All right, guys. Thank you for watching another episode of Truck and Hustle. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe down below. We'll see you next time. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle.